Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to The Definitive Wrap, where we report the truth about the world around us. We stand for true conservative principles and against wokeness. The Definitive Wrap, where we respect people of faith, the men and women in uniform who serve with pride, and our support for Israel. And now, your hosts, Bela Sebro, she's the nice one, and Alan Skorsky. Uh, he's not so nice. But together, they are The Definitive Wrap. Welcome and good afternoon if you're listening to us in Israel, the Middle East, in Europe, and good morning in the U.S. and North America. It's roughly 10 after 4 in Israel and almost time to go home. Bela, before I tell you why I couldn't sleep last night, as if you care, I want to thank my <laughs> friends at allshookup.com. No, not the Elvis song, but the New Jersey-based company who imports and sells all kinds of goodies from the Shook in Israel. Mm, wow. Yummy. And why am I thanking her? Because she was instrumental in connecting us with our incredible guest last week, Yigal Dilmoni, the CEO from the Yesha Council, who gave us an incredible interview about his strategy to fight back against the anti-Semitic Ben and Jerry's BDS tactics against Israel. If you missed that show, you can listen to it right here on Israel News Talk Radio or at thedefinitiverap.com. Now, as to why I couldn't sleep last night, I have been waiting weeks to get in touch with today's guest, a hero and one of the leaders of the Entebbe rescue that took place 45 years ago, July 4th. And today, we finally have him for our interview, which none of you will want to miss. Bela? Well, Alan, you couldn't sleep last night? I'm so excited that our shows are being heard in 160 countries that I can't sleep any night of the week. So there. Uh. And yes, Alan, I do care. Not, well, maybe a little bit. Okay. Anyway, talking about music, I was a young kid when the Entebbe rescue took place, and there were so many songs in Jewish music that were written and sung everywhere about that miraculous rescue that to this day I sing those songs. I'm sure you remember those songs, Alan, oh, but no, I'm not going to sing them for you. Don't Go worry. <laughs> anyway. Our guests are going to be in for such an amazing treat today when they will hear from the former IDF general, Matan Vilnai, one of the leaders of the Entebbe rescue. He will explain the secret strategy and how they managed to fly to Entebbe, land the plane, and complete this mission with such incredible success. So, don't go away. We will be right back. How did a nice Jewish girl from Delaware end up living in Israel? Shalom, I'm Natalie Sapinski. Join me on my show, Returning Home. Meet different people who have moved to Israel. Hear their personal stories, their highs, their lows, and everything in between. Each week, we talk to experts on immigration and the process of moving to Israel. Listen to Returning Home every Thursday, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to The Definitive Wrap with Alan Skorsky and Bela Sebra. Thank you, Mr. Producer. Welcome back to Israel News Talk Radio, and let's begin our show today. Most people can't remember what they did last week, let alone 45 years ago. It was July 4th, 1976, while most Americans were celebrating Independence Day with fireworks and barbecues, the IDF was returning from Entebbe Airport with 102 rescued hostages. For a brief review, on June 27th, Palestinian terrorists hijacked a plane that had left Israel bound for Paris with a stopover in Athens where the hijackers boarded. After refueling in Libya, the plane flew to Uganda in Africa. Soon after landing in Uganda, the hijackers released the non-Israeli passengers, but held the Israelis and Jewish passengers for ransom to release 53 Arab terrorists being held in Israel and European prisons. While Israel was considering its options, the terrorists extended their deadline to July 4th. This extra time allowed for the IDF to devise a rescue operation titled Operation Thunderbolt, later renamed Operation Yonatan, after its leader, Yoni Netanyahu. 
The miracles included the release of the non-Israeli hostages, which allowed the Mossad to interview them to get a precise detail of the hostage shakers in the airport. The fact that an Israeli architect still had the Entebbe airport blueprints gave the IDF much needed information. That the IDF had to fly 8,000 miles in specialized Hercules planes, one of which was 40,000 pounds overweight and almost couldn't take off due to extreme dry weather. These were just some of the miracles. Today's guest is former IDF General Matan Vilnai, whom Bela will introduce shortly, who was one of the heroes who led the IDF to Uganda to tell us about his role in the rescue and what it was like to participate in the greatest hostage rescue in history. Bela? Thank you, Alan. Although some of our younger audience may not have been born yet, I was a young child on June 27, 1976, when an Air France flight with 250 passengers from Tel Aviv to Paris was hijacked by a group of Arab and German terrorists in exchange for 53 terrorists. And the plane was diverted to Entebbe, Uganda, as more than 100 Israeli hostages were held captive. When a few days later, on July 4th, 1976, as the United States state celebrated its 200th birthday, the greatest hostage rescue operation ever in the world took place. I personally coined it Victory and Tebby. As young as I was at that particular time, uh, that rescue mission had a huge personal impact on me. My parents of blessed memory had friends who were on that hijacked flight that left Israel and who witnessed the hand of God through the IDF as miracles were being showered. It was at my parents' dining room table where these stories were being retold. And as I grew into adulthood, I always referred to that rescue mission as I did before, Victory and Tebby. Operation Thunderbolt or Operation Yonatan was always Victory and Tebby to me. And today I'm going to meet one of my childhood heroes and the hero of Operation Yonatan, Thunderbolt, or whatever they want to call it, but victory and tebi to me, Matan Vilnai, former general in the IDF. On the Entebbe rescue, he was the commander of the paratroopers brigade and led the first force that landed at the Entebbe airport and the second in command of the entire operation. General Vilnai also served as a member of the Labor Party as Minister of Science, Culture and Sports. Deputy Defense Minister and Minister of Defense of the Home Front. An ambassador, currently, to, an ambassador to China. <laughs> currently, he has become the president of the first China University in Israel for business and economics. General, oh my goodness, welcome to the definitive wrap. Thank you. You had 48 uh, hours to strategize and only 60 minutes to make this gripping tale of success without suffering major catastrophe on innocent hijacked victims. Please tell us now the secrets of that raid from start to finish, and especially the landing, which was the trickiest part. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my story. Okay. First of all, we were not heroes. This was our mission, and we served in the IDF in order to secure the state of Israel and our citizens all over the world, not only in Israel. And for us, it was obvious. You know, you won't believe it. I was then the commander of the best paratrooper brigade of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, deployed in the Golan Heights, facing the Syrian army. You have to remember that the just three years after the Yom Kippur War, when they took us with full surprise in the Golan Heights. And I was there. And I heard in the radio that an high, they hijacked an, an airline, a French airliner, on its way from uh, Ben Gurion Airport to Paris. I went, we are talking 45 years ago. I took an atlas, I opened the atlas. There is no Google, there is nothing. Right. Open the atlas. And I looked, where is Antebbe? And I found it, Antebbe, on Lake Victoria, on the coast, on the northern coast of Lake Victoria, in the middle of nowhere, on the equator, thousands of miles from Israel. 
I called immediately. I called immediately my commander, that was that was in Tel Aviv, the chief paratrooper and infantry uh, general. Years after that, I took this position too. He is in charge of all the special operations of the Israeli Foreign Forces, and he was a friend of mine. I called him and said, "Done. It was done, Shabron. He was the then the commander. Said, done." Let's go there and take them back home. What is the problem? We had to do it. I talked with no one. And he said to me, okay, we understand it. And that's it. It was, I believe, Monday night, maybe Tuesday morning. And he said to me, okay, with your own business. Thursday night, I visited one of my points along the border near Mount Hermon. He called me and said, come with 80 soldiers to this place near Tel Aviv. I did not ask any question. I understood immediately what was going to be. I took my car. In two hours, I was there with 80, my best soldier, commanded by the battalion commander. And uh, I asked him, OK, what we're we going to do? We had no intelligence. You have to understand that in order to have a, a, an operation like this, first of all, you need a very accurate uh, intelligence about everything. We had nothing, just nothing. We saw only a map that the pilot said there is a maps of all the airports in the world that you can find it whenever you want, you want. And we saw a sketch of the airport, only the runways. No terminals, nothing. And middle of the night, you won't believe it. He called me, he said, Dan said to me, okay, the prime minister would like to see the, the plan. I said, we have no plan. It was the night between Thursday to Friday morning. And uh, we came to Rabin. Rabin was the best prime minister I ever know. And I know some of them. I served as a minister and all this. He was very calm. He said to us, okay, what you can do? We show him nothing. And he said to us, I remember it at the end of my life. I know you Red Bird, part of us with Red Bird. You are sure that you can do everything. This operation, you can't do it. It was one o'clock in the morning. He sent it out of his office in Tel Aviv. And then looked at me, I looked at him, what we're going to do. And uh, we decided that we don't need any permission in order to go ahead. And we uh, gather our forces, our units, we gave an order, there is a military system how to launch an operation, you have to start with an order, and then to understand what is the planning of, of each unit, make it together, to coordinate it, and we did it. From uh, Friday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, till uh, Friday noon, and then he called us. He, it's a tracker being, where are you? I said, we are ready. He said, okay, come again. He called Dan, I came with Dan, and we start all over again. He was absolutely right with us, because our uh, plan, of the operation was really nothing. We planned uh, to jump with hundreds of paratroopers of my unit to get to seize the whole area and then to take out the hostages. And the commander of the Air Force was a very smart general, Benny Pellet. He said to us, it's like robbing a bank. You don't conquer the bank to the safe and out. You have to do this way, although he was not special op, but he was just a smart general and a smart person. And you know, all of them are not with us. All of them are not with us, 45 years ago. And uh, we show, we, present, we submit the program, we change it, we check it, and he said to us, okay, go ahead. It's not a permission, but you have to prepare yourself. We went back to uh, the unit that uh, we had all the rehearsal there. 
it's a uh, but come and uh, we have a plan Friday night it's a last the first and last rehearsal it was a catastrophe but there is a long an old saying with a special operation that if the last rehearsal is catastrophe it could be a very good operation General, the music is coming on. Please hold that thought and we'll resume right after these messages. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back. To the definitive rap with Alan Skorsky and Bela Sebro. And welcome back to Israel News Talk Radio. General, right before the break, you were telling us that old adage that if the first rehearsal fails, the next one will surely succeed. So please continue from where you left off. So uh, it was uh, again one o'clock in the morning. The chief of staff gathered the whole the main commanders of the operation, it would be three or four of us, and he asked each one of them personally what he believed will be the success uh, of the operation. I am a very optimistic figure, and I said 50-50. My friends, my colleagues, they said less than 50-50. And they listened to us, He was not absolutely with us, but he was our commander. And uh, it was two or three o'clock in the morning. I decided to go home to take a sleep. I have to sleep. So I went to Jerusalem. It's less than an hour drive. I entered my, uh, my house. My wife said to me, she... Work and he said to me, Matan, what we should do with the people in Uganda? I said, we can do nothing about it, just nothing. And I took a sleep of two hours, and then I went back to the people that you can do nothing with them. I said nothing to them. And uh, Friday, uh, Saturday noon, last briefing, The chief of staff is in a cabinet meeting, so the deputy chief of staff, that he was absolutely with us. You have to understand, most of the generals were, they were not true. But the deputy chief of staff, uh, you could tell Adam, he was killed in Lebanon in 82, and the Air Force commander, Benny Pellet, they were under percent with us. And the main lesson of Antebe, and I said it now, it's that you don't need only the people high in the high levels. Antebe, it's a bottom-up operation. It's not up-down, it's bottom-up operation. When I'm saying bottom, it's our level, it's colonel. It's not, uh, it's not kids, but it's colonels, not the prime minister, not the minister of defense, not the, the chief of staff. They, of course, they approved it, but it was our feeling that we can do it. And it's very important, and when I'm talking about Antebe to young officers, I tell them this is the most important lesson of Antebe. Not a courageous operation, not far away, but the feeling in the rank and file down under that we can do it. It's very important. Mm. And there was the last uh, uh, briefing with the deputy chief. And one of the people asked him, and if uh, Dan Shabon, the commander, will be hit, he will take command. He looked and said, Matan, this is your mission. I said to him, I know Dan, he will never get it. I uh, went with him dozens of operations. He's a wonderful guy, and nothing will happen to him. 
and we flew. <laughs> when we took off from Sharm el Sheikh, four o'clock Saturday afternoon, there was no permission from the for the operation from the from the cabinet. They were still debating, and we took off. And there was some point above Ethiopia that we can refuel only Orient Antebbe or back home in Sinai in Israel. And we need to have a password to go ahead till this moment. And we got it. We got it. And you, four heavy aircraft, the Hercules, the C-130, the best in the world, American made, of course. And uh, the, the four aircraft approaching Antebbe, it's a military operation. So we sent three of them to circle 100 miles in the side and reach Antebbe with one aircraft, with the Black Mercedes, with two jeeps, with the best unit of Sayyid Makal and my people that have the second, the second circle around them. And uh, in the first aircraft were all the commanders on the units to accomplish the mission. We reached Tebe, and the control tower start to speak with broken English. Who are you? What are you doing? And the three, four of us stood in the cockpit gave advices to the pilot. The pilot is a squadron commander, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Siki Sane, a very uh, wonderful guy. He listened to no one. He just spoke with him, with his uh, Palestinian English, his African English, and no one understand what is going on. And it was full light of the, of the uh, runway. And we just left without talking nothing. And then they took off the lights. We knew it before. And we had in my first, in the first plan, we had one of my units, a paratroopers, commanded with now his very famous uh, General uh, Donald Mogg, then he was a captain, a commander of my special unit. And uh, I uh, sent them. When the aircraft taxi on the runway, they jump from both sides and they put lights next to the light, the Ugandan lights. And when they took off the lights, our lights on both sides were there. And the second uh, 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 transporter, the second pilot, he passed away a few months ago, a wonderful guy, Drill, he saw our lights and he landed accordingly. And then we drove to the old terminal. My unit took the uh, new terminal and the head and the uh, old area around. There was two circles, one circle of the old terminal commanded by Sayyid Matkal Bayon Netanyahu, a good friend of mine from Jerusalem. In a minute, I'll go back to it. And the second circle of all the units around under my command of paratroopers and everything. And uh, in 10 minutes, it was all over. They reached the old terminal. There was a two Ugandan soldiers. They start to shout to them. And Yoni pulled a pistol and shot them. He missed all the, the rounds. But it's open, it's open fire all around. And we lost the surprise element. And our soldiers stormed the old terminal, commanded by the second in command of Netanyahu, and Muki Betra, one of he was my officer too. And in less than a minute, it was all over. Ten minutes since we landed, it was all over. And the hostages, they were shot. They were really shocked. They won't believe it. And we killed one of the hostages because he jumped mm -hmm. and he shouted in Hebrew, Jean-Jacques Maimoni, and he was killed on the spot. 
and we killed immediately the uh, terrorists around. There were Germans, two Germans and two Palestinians, and there were other terrorists in another room, and we killed them too. The Ugadin soldiers fled away, and it was all over. And uh, <laughs> we had to refuse. I brought with one of the uh, transporters was a pump. Think, what is a pump? It's some kind of a machine, it's a pump. In the middle of the night, I heard, I saw a train of uh, small uh, vehicles towed to each other, coming to my position, towed to a Peugeot 404, a small pickup. This is the pump. <laughs> and we start to refuel, and then we got an order to stop it and to go to uh, Nairobi to refuel there. And we stopped the refueling, and there was a problem what to do with the pump, because the hostages, there, they took the place of the pump. So I had to take a decision. What to do, to leave the pump or to leave the Peugeot to the Ugandan? Because we can't take both of them. Of course, I took the pickup because it's of my, my brigade, the pickup, it was mine, and I left the pump. <laughs> And we flew to Uganda, and uh, there I realized that Yoni is dead, because before we saw he is something that is injured, something like this. We I saw his body and I understood that he uh, that it, he was dead. We grew up in the same neighborhood in Jerusalem. His father was a professor. My father was a professor. And there was a rumor in Jerusalem that the Israeli commander raided Antebbe and one high officer from the paratrooper from Jerusalem, his father, a professor, was killed. It could be or me or young. And think about my wife back in Jerusalem when we heard that we can do nothing about the, uh, the hostages and what happened there. And we flew back home. We were on the ground, I believe, 50 minutes, something like this. The most important thing was, first of all, to take them by surprise, and we did it. And then, you can't believe it, to count the hostages. General, I apologize, but the music is back. We're coming up on a hard break, but please stay tuned, and we'll be right back with the last segment of today's show with our special guest, General Matan Vilnai. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany is but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel. Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound the most essential, and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power. We're back with Alan and Bela on the Definitive Rap Radio Show. Welcome back, Israel News Talk Radio, to our last segment of the day. We are here with our very special guest, General Matan Velnai, one of the leaders of the historic rescue at Entebbe, recalling for us what it was like for him 45 years ago, July 4th. General, in the last segment, you ended telling us that once the hijackers separated the Israeli and Jewish passengers from the other passengers, that this became a very personal issue to the state of Israel and to all of your troops. Please continue. Till then, they were talking about, it's not our problem, it's a French problem, it's a French airliner, it's nothing. 
the main lesson is that we can do it only by ourselves. There is no other way. And it's not heroic, it's our mission, it's obvious. And in the future, if we we'll have to do it again, we can do it again. And as I said before, it's bottom up. It's not that the prime minister and the cabinet decided. Right. You know, the commander of the intelligence officer, the commander of the intelligence, the military intelligence, Shlomo Gazit, he passed away a year ago. He told me that he was in the, in the cabinet and Rabin said to the minister, we have no other option, only to send our people there to bring them back home. Because before they were talking about uh, dealing with the, uh, with the terrorists and giving them whatever they want. You have to remember that in 1970, 1968, one year after the, the Six Day War, they took our El Al plan from Rome to Algeria yes. and we gave whatever they asked us in order to bring our people back home. It was 10 years before. It was in eight years before, eight years before. And in Antebbe, our feeling was that we can do it. When I'm saying we, it's the level of the brigade commanders, of the special unit commanders, and we show confidence to the high command that we can do it. In the military, the most important figure is the chief of staff. He is not the commander of the army, but he is the main military figure. The commander is the Israeli cabinet, the Israeli government. And he was not with us. He was not sure that we can do it. And for us as soldiers, it's very easy. The chief of staff don't believe in it, so we won't do it. But we decided that we can do it. It's the most important lesson from Antebbe is the responsibility of the low level. It's not only the high level as we use to see them on the TV in peacetime that we, they talk all the time and we are in the field. The main lesson is that we are the most important figure. I used to say the people in the bloodline, which means in the front, are the most important people. Right. We need the headquarters, we need the generals. I was a general, I know it. And it's very important to, to have the whole strategy. But in order to accomplish a mission, it's our problem. And Antebbe, it's a wonderful example that we can do it, and it's our responsibility. We feel it, we understand it, and we push up, we can do it. This is our son Antebbe. Okay. And I tell you just a small story. You know about about the Black Mercedes. Where is my Black Mercedes? Okay. I have a picture of the Black Mercedes. In a minute, I bring it. Yeah. In a minute, wait a minute, I bring the picture. Okay. Can you see it? Wow! Yes, I remember that this picture. Is the Black Mercedes. Oh and wow! Today, on the side, this young officer. It's me. It's when we uh, landed back in uh, Ben Gurion Airport, and this is the Black Mercedes. And uh, the soldier next to me was after that the CEO of the Ministry of Defense. Many years, when I was a deputy, he was the CEO of the Ministry of Defense. And this is the Black Mercedes. And yes. the of the Black Mercedes. It's very simple. We saw in one of the film about Antebbe Airport that the high uh, officials of uh, Uganda are coming to the airport with a black Mercedes and two jeeps. Okay. And we said, okay, we have to bring this black Mercedes and two jeeps. And fine a black Mercedes in Israel of 76, third day's night, you need it immediately on the spot. It's not now, I believe it's very easy. Yeah. 
After that, I was the uh, uh, ambassador to China, to Beijing. And one of the diplomats, the Israeli diplomat said to me, ambassador, the black man said, this is mine. Said to him, I know it. Everyone is saying that this is. And he showed me a letter from the Minister of Defense. They, they took the, the Mercedes. It was not black. They took the Mercedes and uh, they needed it in a short time. And that's it. And Yoni gave an order to his people to find uh, Saturday morning. You know what is the meaning of Saturday morning in Israel? Yeah. To find a uh, paint and to paint the Mercedes in black. He sent people and they entered a store in Petrotigva. They took it. The store owner was, of course, in synagogue. They took it from synagogue. He opened the store. They took it and they painted it on the, on the, on the last moment. And the black Mercedes was very important in order to take them with full supply. This is the story of Antabe. It's now, after 45 years, it seemed to be something fantastic. Yeah. But for us then, it was obvious that we are going to do it, and we are the only ones, and we can do it. And this is the story from them. Yeah. So, General, I was 13 during the hijacking, and I was in London, and I flew to Israel the day after the rescue from my brother's bar mitzvah. And every time I watch the videos on YouTube, I promise you, I'm a tough guy. I cry every time. I think about you and your colleagues. And, and I, I watched the interviews. There was, uh, you mentioned Shiki Shani and, uh, and Muki Betzer and, and, and Amnon Biran, all of them. I think you were in your 20s and you're in your, you were your 30s. You're kids. You're not today wise people. And you're flying to Uganda. And I think in the video it said that they gave you, the Knesset gave you the green light an hour before your landing. And again, we have about three minutes left. Can you tell us what goes through the mind of a 30-year-old? Because even though you said, you know, you said you're not a hero, you're a hero, but you want to be modest, that's fine. What goes through the mind of a 30-year-old one hour before you're about to touch down in Uganda? This wasn't Sabina. This wasn't at, in, in Lord Airport. This is in Uganda. What goes through the mind? We've about two and a half minutes left. What goes through your mind? <laughs> It's a wonderful question, a really wonderful question. And I must tell you, we are over the jungle. You won't believe, I was saying to myself, we are on the, on the own direction. Home is there. Why you are you flying there? It's all the time it's running on your mind. But at the end, you understand that you must do it. And there is no other way. I was then uh, 76 or then 32 years old. I was a very old uh, full colonel of 30, uh, two, uh, 32 years old. And in some point, this is the mission of a life. Although I uh, participate in dozens of missions all over the Middle East. And uh, as a young mayor, I, the, my, as a young captain, a lantern operation in Upper Egypt, and a lot of stories. But for me, as I said before, it was we must do it. And you have to know that we had an operation two years before in my lot, and we failed. And 20 kids have been murdered by the terrorists. And there was a very famous picture all over the media of those days of a young soldier with a girl on his hand, wounded girl. This wounded girl is now a mother of two paratroopers. So what is the question? Uh, General, uh, we have just a few seconds left. Uh, this was the most daring mission of my generation. How did this mission shape Israel? What effect did it have on the country and the morale of its citizens? I could tell you what it did for me personally, but I want to hear from you the effect it had on Israeli citizens. I can tell you that they sent me 
to the US first time in my life to speak, to submit, to present the operation to the Jewish community all over the state. And there was a cartoon in California. You won't believe it. I, I, had, to, I, I had to keep it. The cartoon was saying, the United States of America, don't be afraid, Israel behind you. That's it. Okay. Is- Thank you, General Vilna E. for joining us today. It was an honor to meet you and to listen to your story. On behalf of Bela and myself, we want to thank our audience at Israel News Talk Radio for joining us here every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Israel time and 9 a.m. Eastern time in the States. You can listen to all our shows here or at thedefinitivewrap.com. Have a great rest of the week and Shabbat Shalom. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.home page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.